Good morning. It is good to see each one of you. Amen. A lot of what we've been dealing with here in the last number of uh, weeks has been just not seeing folks and having contact. And, and we're glad that you're here, but obviously you can tell that we're providing you a way to see one another in a little bit different fashion than what we're used to at our sanctuary. So before we begin here this morning, we're going to just, again, review a little bit of how we're doing things here, just so you know what to expect while you're here today. Obviously, we're social distancing here today, and uh, we want you to continue to do that if at all possible. And uh, also, if uh, you're coming, we encourage you to use a mask. But if you don't have one, it's not mandatory that you use one. And if you need one, we've got some masks out there, and we'll provide those for you as long as we've got them. Something else that's a little bit different, obviously, is um, we're probably, well, not probably, we're, we're not going to give you an opportunity to shake hands and hug necks and all that kind of thing. Uh, so that's not going to happen in our service. Also, want to draw your attention back to the door that you came in through. Uh, right there inside the door is our offering box. Uh, we're not going to be passing an offering plate, but there is that offering box there that's available for you. So uh, prior to the service, if, when you come, if you want to put your offering in there, do that. After the service, you can do that, but we're just not going to have a prescribed time for us all to do that. So we're giving you the leeway to do that according to when you think of it and when you have the opportunity to do it. As you came in, uh, obviously, too, you notice that we, we don't have uh, a nursery or any kind of children's uh, opportunities here this morning and uh, we don't have Sunday school we don't we're not planning on Wednesday nights or Sunday nights yet we just don't know what this is going to be like in the days ahead uh, but we are thankful and I think you can agree with me we are thankful that we can meet here together and worship the Lord Jesus Christ together amen thank you for being here now if, if you're uh, with us here today and you're a guest this is what I'm asking you to do, and I'm asking all of us to do this, uh, in fact. So uh, take out your phones, if you would, and I've left mine over here, so let me go ahead and get it. Everybody take out your phone. If you're a guest with us, this is how we're asking you to kind of register that you've visited with us. If you'll use your phone and go to our website, www.fbcraycity.org. If you go there, you'll see our front page, and up at the upper left corner, you'll see those three little lines that's a drop-down uh, list. Uh, make that list drop down and then go to the connection form uh, uh, entry on that list and it'll take you to a place where you can put in some information about yourself and uh, we would appreciate if you're visiting with us to do that right now. So if you've got the opportunity to do it right now with your phone, go ahead and do that. Uh, the rest of us who took our phones out, this is just a friendly reminder, let's, let's all put them on silence. That'd be a good thing for us all to do here uh, in preparation for uh, worship here today. Well, we're glad that you're here. We're going to begin here this morning with worship uh, with a word of prayer. And our deacon of the week, uh, E.W., is going to lead us in that word of prayer as we gather together in worship. So, E.W., you come and lead us in prayer. First hymn this morning is the Lily of the Valley.
Steve for that and Nell and appreciate all that uh, you are doing and helping us to worship here today and I need to say that not only for them but also for our technical people who are making sure that we can turn this uh, facility into a worship service and thank you so much for making that possible. Now I'm pretty sure that uh, most of you have heard this saying. Um, have you ever heard someone say, well if, if life hands you a lemon, make lemonade out of it. Ever, ever heard that? Even if that's the first time you've ever heard it, um, we all understand basically what's being communicated there, right? If times are tough or hard, uh, we can focus on what makes it tough or hard. ...used to show his commitment to serve Jesus Christ even in the midst of adverse situations. Now, we're not going to hear much about the adversity that Paul has uh, previously experienced, but we know that he experienced them. If you've been in church any time at all or in Sunday school lessons, you know that Paul, because he went to so many different places preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, that sometimes he was beaten because of that. Sometimes he was beaten uh, so uh, badly that they left him for dead. Other times Paul had been run out of town or thrown into prison. Paul has experienced a great deal of adversity because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And what we're going to see in this passage in just a few moments is that Paul is anticipating trouble when he shows up in Jerusalem. Yet what we hear in these verses is Paul's unswerving commitment to serve Jesus Christ even in these adverse circumstances. And church, that says something to you and me today in light of our circumstances today. Uh, we're going to put this up on the screen just to kind of help us uh, get our focus all together. But you know, here it is. Even during a global pandemic, God still wants his people to proclaim Christ. Would you agree with that by saying amen? amen. We're in difficult circumstances here. We know that. But Jesus is still on the throne. Amen? amen. Jesus is still in control of what is taking place, not only around us, but leading us as his people to continue to further the kingdom. Now, I know that for some of us, uh, life has slowed down and perhaps 
In some areas, life has changed so dramatically that things have even stopped happening. And you know, we've, we've been hearing ever since this started to not do certain things, to stop doing this, stop going to the grocery, stop hugging one another, stop shaking hands, uh, stop going out in public. Church, I wanna give you three things we can do, okay? Let, let's look at this passage of scripture and let's let it guide us in three things we can do. Instead of wringing our hands or saying, woe is me, or moaning or groaning about the coronavirus, even as bad as it is, let's intentionally do some things. Let's not put our service to Christ on hold. And this passage of scripture can help us see three things that we can do even in the midst of this pandemic. And here's the first one. We can encourage other believers. You've got your Bibles open. Look at Romans, the 15th chapter, verse 14. Let's look at it together. Paul, in writing to the church at Rome, he says, he writes this. My brothers and sisters, I myself am convinced about you that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Now, let me just ask you. Those are encouraging words, aren't they? Sure they are. Paul wrote to them and encouraged these, uh, un, these uh, believers. And, and church, not only had Paul experienced his fair share of adversity, but in first century, especially a place like Rome, it was tough being a believer in Jesus Christ. And as we know from history, things got even worse as time progressed. These believers themselves were facing adverse circumstances. But Paul wrote and encouraged them. And you know, that's something you and I can do in the midst of this pandemic. We've been told not to do a lot of things, but here's something we can do. We can encourage other believers just like Paul did. Now, what did he say to them in this letter? Look at it with me. Verse 14. He encouraged them, first of all, Paul, by, by saying that you are full of goodness. Now, let's hit the pause button here just for a second. Make sure we're theologically uh, correct here. The Bible tells us that none of us are good. Amen or oh me. You, you, you get that, right? The, the Bible tells us we're all uh, sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. But Paul writes to these believers and says, I see that you're full of goodness. Now, here's the only way that can happen in, in a human being. The only way we can be full of goodness is if Jesus is in there. Amen? So, he's saying, I'm encouraging you. I see the goodness in you. And it's because of Jesus and his presence in them. But Paul is also saying you're full of goodness to the degree where you have responded to the good thing that God has done for you. He saved you. And in turn, you've shown goodness to other people. You're full of goodness. And he's encouraged them by saying that to them. Now, let me just ask you a question. Do you know another believer that would be encouraged if you were to go to them and say, I want to tell you something that I see happening in your life. I see that you're full of goodness. I see that you have responded appropriately to what God has done to you and in you, and you're being good to other people. Do you know somebody that would be encouraged to hear that? If you do, tell them. Wouldn't that be a good thing? I think it'd be a great thing to do. Here's something else that Paul wrote to them that encouraged them. He said, I also see that you're filled with all knowledge. Now, he wasn't saying, I've heard that all of you have a high IQ. He wasn't saying that. Again, to have knowledge and all knowledge is only because of the presence of Jesus Christ. So when he says, I see that you're all filled with uh, knowledge, he's saying, I can see that you know God. You know his truth. You know how to apply that truth in your life. And he encourages them by saying that. He's saying you're responding to the truth of God in your life. Now, let me just ask you, do you know a fellow believer that would be encouraged if you were to go to them and say to them, hey, you know, I see God at work in your life to the degree that you know who he is. And not only that, you are responding to his truth appropriately. You're allowing God's word to influence you, to guide you in your thoughts and actions and the way you live your life. Do you know someone that would be encouraged if you were to tell them that? If you do, do it. That'd be a great thing to do during this time of crisis. Finally, Paul wrote to them and encouraged them this way. He says, you're also able to instruct one another. Now, again, this is because of the presence of Christ in them. And so he's saying it's evident that you are helping one another become more like Jesus Christ. You're growing spiritually. Do you know someone 
that would benefit if you were to go to them and say to them honestly, hey, I see you growing spiritually. Do you know someone that would benefit hearing that? If you do, why don't you do that? Why don't you encourage them? Here it is, church. I want to encourage you during this pandemic to encourage others. That's something that we can do in spite of all the things we've been told not to do. That's something we can do. Here's something else we can do during this pandemic. We can point non-believers to Christ Jesus. Let's look at verses 15 through 21 right now. Paul writes, Nevertheless, I've written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest of the gospel of God. My purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to boast in Christ Jesus regarding what pertains to God. For I would not dare say anything except what Christ has accomplished through me by word and deed for the obedience of the Gentiles, by the power of miraculous signs and wonders, and by the power of the Spirit. As a result, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. My aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named so that I will not build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Now, there's a lot going on in those verses, but you heard Paul's commitment to point non-believers to Christ Jesus. And that's something that you and I can do even in the midst of this pandemic. Now, you know, when we're facing adversity or difficult circumstances, uh, those circumstances can overwhelm us to the degree that that's all we talk about. Have you ever met somebody like that? Uh, when you have a conversation with them, it's always about one subject and it's whatever's troubling them. But Paul says, in spite of the adversity that he has experienced and is going to experience when he gets to Jerusalem, he's saying, I don't want to focus on the crisis. I want to focus on Christ. That's something you and I can do. Instead of focusing on the crisis, let's focus on pointing non-believers to Jesus Christ. And Paul mentions two ways that he goes about it. And I think it's great to, for us to take that model and use it. So Paul says one of the ways that he points non-believers to Jesus Christ is by bragging on Jesus. Look at verse 17. He says, therefore, I have reason to boast in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? He's bragging on Jesus. He's talking about all the good things that Christ has done. Instead of focusing on the coronavirus and letting that be the only topic of information or conversation that we have. And I don't know about you, but, but I'm tired of every news report and every thing I see having something to do with the coronavirus. Amen or oh me. Are you with me? Uh, I, you know, we don't have to be that way. But we can still point to Jesus Christ and talk about him and talk about all the good things that he's done for us. Now, church, if you, if you need some ammunition, let me just give you some right now, okay? You know, we could, as a church, right now, we could just be moaning and groaning and saying, what a shame. We have not been able to worship together for a number of weeks. We don't have Sunday school going on. All these bad things are happening. We could be doing that, but I hope we don't. I hope what we do instead is make lemonade and look at it this way. Let me ask you, did Jesus know this pandemic was coming? Well, did he or not? He did. Does Jesus love us? Yes, he does. Now, church, a couple of years ago, maybe more than a couple of years ago, but God said to us as a church, I want you to build a, a facility. And we built this, God helped us to build this facility in order to take the gospel to our community. But church, look around. What also has this done for us? It's let us come together and worship. God knew this pandemic was coming, but you know what he did for us? He provided for us a way for us to come together in an easy way to continue to worship him in spite of the pandemic. Let me just say, church, if you just start thinking about how difficult it would be for us to meet in our other sanctuary right now, it, it would be hard. We, we probably would have to have two different services and we'd have to have sections of the pews cordoned off and we'd have to say, you can't sit here because you'll be too close to people. And, and, and I don't to get people upset because you've got your own places to sit, right? I mean, it's got your name on it. So, you know, it would, it would be bad. But what did God do for us? 
He provided a way for us, even in this pandemic, to come together in a safe way and worship. Is God good or not? Listen, here's something else. God made sure that in our congregation there were people who had the ability to record sermons and use uh, laptops and iPads and, and use sound systems and all that kind of stuff and be able to post this stuff online. God made sure we had people in our congregation that knew how to do that. Now, is God good or not? He's good, isn't he? He's done some great things for us. So here, here we go, church, and we could keep going. We could, we could talk about D-Life. God knew this pandemic was coming, so God said, hey, uh, start D-Life groups. You're not going to be able to have Sunday school at some point in time, but if you've got D-Life groups, they're small enough where you can meet and social distance and still grow together in Christ. Well, that was a great thing that God did for us. We can brag about Jesus because he is good, and he has done many good things for us. It's just a matter of focus and attitude. But now... Look at verse 18. There's a really important disclaimer there that gives us some direction. Verse 18, Paul says, For I would not dare say anything except what Christ has accomplished through me by word and deed. Church, I don't know about you, but I've heard people in the past in other churches and other situations give their own personal testimony. But when that personal testimony was over, they testified about their own goodness instead of the goodness of, of God. Have you ever heard those kind of testimonies? They built themselves up instead of building God up. Listen, we want to point people to Jesus Christ. So what does that mean we have to do? We take a back seat and we brag on Jesus. We talk about how good he is. Not how good we are. We talk about how good he is. Paul said, I wouldn't say a word to anybody except that which God has done through me. One of the ways that we can point people to Jesus is to brag on him. But Paul also says we've got to fully proclaim the gospel. Look at verse 19. At the very end of verse 19, it says, As a result, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem all the way around Illyricum. And the point there is not the span of geography there. The point here is that Paul said, I have fully proclaimed the gospel. Listen, church, it's great for us in our regular conversations to interject Jesus Christ. I hope you're finding ways to do that, to talk about Jesus during this pandemic. It's good to talk about him and it's good to brag about him. But church, we have not fully proclaimed the gospel to a non-believer until we have said, and this goodness that is in Jesus Christ can be yours if you will put your faith in him and trust in him. You will experience the forgiveness of sin. His presence will take up residence in you. You will be saved and he will stick closer than a brother for all the rest of your life and be there when you leave this life to take you into eternity. And it can be yours. Church, we have not fully proclaimed the gospel until we say to the people we're talking to, you can make a decision today to trust Christ. We've got to fully proclaim the gospel if we're truly going to point people to Jesus Christ. People don't need to know about Jesus. They need to know Jesus. Amen. And that's something that we can do. We've been told all kinds of things not to do during this pandemic. But we can do this. We can point people to Jesus Christ. Finally, we can do this as well. In verses 30 through 33, we can pray for missionaries. Look at these verses. That's what those verses are all about. Look at them with me together. Verse 30. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in fervent prayers to God on my behalf. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, and that, by God's will, I may come to joy and be refreshed together with you. May the God of peace be with all of you. Amen. Now here's Paul writing to the church, and he asked them for something. And it's right to think of Paul as a missionary because, I mean, he's, he was, and he was a missionary to the Gentiles, right? So here's this missionary, and he's writing to the church, and he asks them for something, but he doesn't ask for money. He doesn't ask for resources. He doesn't ask them to send people to help him. He asks for prayer. And, you know, if you've ever talked to a missionary and asked them, what can we do to support you? Nine times out of ten, the first thing that will come out of their mouth is prayer. Amen. Our missionaries need our prayers. And that's something that you and I can do even during the midst of this pandemic. 
Now, Paul asked for prayer as a missionary in three specific ways, and I think it's a great model for you and me as far as how we should pray for our missionaries. The first thing he asked there uh, for was prayer for his protection. Look again at verse 31. He says, pray that I may be from the unbelievers in Judea. Now, church, there's only one implication about that request. That was Paul anticipated that when he got to Jerusalem, there were going to be non-believers there who were going to cause pr trouble, cause him problems. And <clears throat> look, in the past, what's happened to Paul? He's been in prison. He's been beaten. He doesn't know to what degree this opposition is going to be, but he asked the church in Rome to pray for his protection. Now, you know as well as I do that we've got missionaries in areas of the world that need our prayers for protection. Amen. They're in difficult circumstances. They're in places that are even dangerous as far as their lives are concerned. So something you and I can do is pray for our missionaries and pray for their protection. Paul also asked them to pray with regards to his ministry that it might be effective. Look at the rest of verse 31. He, also, he says there, I also want you to pray that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. What is this ministry that he's speaking of? Well throughout the region there to different churches getting money from them to help the saints who are in Jerusalem who are suffering and scholars tell us that it could be because there was a famine going on there and so Paul has this collection of money from these Gentile churches that he's going to give to the saints there in Jerusalem and he wants that money to do what it should do to relieve their suffering and to help them but there's another aspect of, uh, aspect of that that I want to make sure you know as I mentioned, he made this collection from Gentile churches. And back then, there was still some friction between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. It was Paul's hope that this collection that he brings to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem would help bridge the gap between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. He wanted it to begin to facilitate the unity that God's people should have. And so he asked the church in Rome, pray that this is an effective way of bringing people together. We can pray for our missionaries today in the same way. We want to pray. I, I know I do, and I, I'm sure you do too. We want to pray that whatever our missionaries are doing will further the kingdom of God. We want to pray that way, don't we? Their ministry is effective. So that's something that we can do. And finally, Paul asked them to pray for his spiritual renewal. Look at verse 32. And that by God may come to you with joy and be refreshed together with you. It's an understatement to say that mission work is hard work. Some of you know that firsthand. It's difficult. It was difficult for Paul. It's no, no different today. Being a missionary today has its own set of challenges. And look, we're human beings. Paul, in spite of being perhaps head and shoulders over other people as a believer back then, he was still a human being. He still experienced all the things that we experience emotionally and mentally as individuals. And here he's praying or asking the church to pray for him that he could be renewed, that he could experience a refreshment in spending time with them. Look, you know as well as I do that for our missionaries today, we provide sabbaticals and times for them to have downtime. It's important. And church, we want to pray that these missionaries who are on the front lines of spreading the gospel to the very ends of the earth can be spiritually renewed and refreshed so that they can be rejuvenated and go back out and perform the task that God has called them to do. There's not a whole lot that we are being told we can do during this pandemic. We're mostly being told things we can't do. But church, here's something we can do. We can encourage other believers. We can point non-believers to Jesus Christ. We can pray for our missionaries. You know, church, that's one way that we can take this sour situation and turn it into something sweet. That's one way we can make lemonade. I'm going to try and illustrate everything I've been talking about here now. And uh, hopefully this will make sense to you. It made sense to me, but that's no guarantee it's going to make sense to you. But you see what I've got here? This is a sponge. Here's a bucket. And it's got water in it. And you know what a sponge does to water, right? It soaks it up. Now, there's none in here right now. And I'll prove that there's none in here right now because I'm squeezing it. I'm putting pressure on it. That's the key word, pressure. 
Now, before we go any further, we know from a biblical standpoint and just generally speaking that whatever is inside of us will come out when we experience pressure. Are you tracking me? You understand what I'm saying? Church, in recent days, we have seen what has come out of people because of the pressure of injustice, the pressure of this pandemic. Those people were filled with rage and hatred and violence. And when the pressure got too great, what was inside of them came pouring out. But you're different. The Bible says that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you've been filled with his presence. So church, what we need to do is we need to continue to soak up the goodness of God. We need to continue to allow ourselves to be immersed in Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. Now, here's this sponge. Kind of looks the same, but once I add pressure to it, what happens? What was inside came pouring out. Church, for you and me, this is a good model as to how we should respond to the pandemic. Make sure that you're in good relationships with Jesus Christ. Make sure that you're doing all the right things, continuing to be in his word, continuing to grow spiritually prayer and all those good things. And when the pressure from this pandemic begins to influence you, the goal there is to allow what's inside of you to come out. So let's let the pressure of this pandemic allow Jesus to pour out of us and put him on display to a lost and dying world. Now that leads me to ask you a very important question. Has the pandemic soured your relationship with Jesus? Look, we're human beings. We're emotional people. Times have gotten difficult and tough. Some of us have experienced more hardship than others. And you know, if we're not careful, we'll allow that pandemic to be a more powerful influencer than the presence of Christ in our lives. And it can sour that relationship with Christ. I want to encourage you here this morning to allow Jesus Christ and his presence in your life to, to, to be what fills you and what pours out of you in the midst of this pandemic. In other words, church, let's, let's stop focusing on the lemon. Let's make lemonade. And what you can do as a believer is you can encourage other believers. You can point non-believers to Jesus Christ and you can pray. And listen, church, those are things that make a difference. Now you may be here this morning and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. This whole idea of being filled with the presence of Christ is something that's new to you. Or maybe you've heard about it and you've just never seen the need to do that. But I want to make sure that you know today, especially today, that if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're in a dangerous set of circumstances. And it's not just because of the pandemic. The Bible tells us that if we end our lives physically here on this planet without Jesus Christ, we will spend all of eternity in hell. But the good news is, is that the gift of God is found in eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that's a gift that God wants you to have. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to encourage you to make that decision here today. However, most of us here probably are believers. But the question still remains, what's your focus? Is your focus on the pandemic? Or is your focus still on Christ and making him famous? Maybe as a believer here today, you've come to the realization that God is calling you right now to make a commitment, a recommitment to him, to make sure that wherever you are, no matter what's going on, you're going to be that positive influence. You're going to take this lemon and make lemonade out of it. Perhaps you need to rededicate your life. Maybe you just need to pray. Maybe you just need someone to talk to about what's going on in your life. We don't know exactly what your need is, but we do stand here before you 
uh, willing to try and meet whatever spiritual needs you do have here today. So we're going to have an invitation, but it's going to be a little bit different than what we've done in the past. One of our pastors is going to be up here, and if you have a decision that you need to make, we invite you to come forward. But as you do, that pastor is going to take you either to the right or to the left to one of the rooms over here, a place where you can social distance, but still talk about your decision that you're making here today. Do you need to do that today? God asking you today to start making lemonade? If he is, won't you respond and say yes? Steve, come and lead us in this hymn of invitation. And as Steve leads us, this is your opportunity to make a decision to allow your focus to be on Christ instead of the crisis. Won't you come? Glad that you uh, were willing to uh, come out and be a part of this uh, very different worship service. Listen, if uh, once this uh, service concludes, if there's still a decision that you feel led to make, come find me or Kevin or Charles or someone. We don't want you to go from this place without having uh, made sure that your relationship with Christ is secure. We're going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to sing after that, right, Steve? So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we're grateful that no matter what we face, we can lean on someone who's greater. Lord, not only did you know this pandemic was coming, but Lord, you even helped us be prepared for it. Lord, we want to respond to that by saying to you that we want to be faithful even during the midst of these adverse circumstances. So Lord, give us strength and power, power that comes from you and your presence. Lord, help us to continue to be faithful to the call you placed upon our lives, just like Paul was. And Lord, as we uh, seek out ways to point non-believers to you, we pray that that'll be effective and that as we encounter people who are asking the big questions, who perhaps are even frightened, we can provide them with the hope that can come only through you. Lord, go with us from this place. Watch over us. Protect us. Bring us back together. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Got a quick announcement for Sunday school. Uh, if you were not here last week, Go out the door here, right to your right. There are Sunday school books, the large print and the regular. Just get what you're used to. There's also the open windows and some other literature that you may be used to getting. Feel free to stop over there and grab that. As far as teachers goes, your leadership books are due to be delivered tomorrow. So anytime after tomorrow afternoon, I think you can check with Miss Trish just inside the Welcome Center. 
we have them all laid out with all of your uh, material for the teachers. At this time, we're going to close with God Bless America.